Good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to another episode of Questions About Music. Um, Questions About Music is the colloquium series of the music department here at the U of A. And uh, as any colloquium series, we have guests joining us from very close by and very far. I'm introducing my, my guests in a second. But um, just to give you a sense, something that we do differently from other colloquium series is that we uh, don't ask for formal paper presentations, but we have conversation with the people that we invite to um, to share their knowledge, their, um, their insights, their performance experience. And this is a platform really for composer, performers, academics, people interested in all uh, corners of music studies, from musicologies to ethnomusicologies, popular music and media studies, and much more. And we also uh, do this, we have this platform for people that have um, things that are curious about and that are connecting with music. So if there are people in the audience or after um, that I have uh, things that would like to see in this, in this platform, uh, people that you'd like us to invite and question, this is a perfect time to get in touch. Uh, there's also the email, um, questions about music at uAlberta.com if you want to suggest topics for next year's. We'll have another of these session in April with um, Jill Rogers talking about trauma studies and music. But then we'll, let's say that the calendar is still open for what's happening next year and we very much accept suggestions. But here and now, my name is Fabio Morabito. I am a musicologist here at the U of A. And I'm joined by my colleague, uh, Tim Shantz, who is a uh, professor of choral conducting and director of choral activities, and by Mikkel Ostriga, who is joining us remotely from uh, Germany, where he's right now around 9 p.m., so he probably has had already kind of like dinner and maybe a couple of beers. But, uh, <laughs> but we really wanted to have Michael uh, with us today because he, um, which is, uh, he's one of the people perfectly placed to have a conversation uh, with us about the topic of today, which is how to handle music that Mozart left unfinished. Michael very recently um, edited, completed Mozart Requiem, um, created, com recomposed, provided a completion. We're going to talk about what that means and what that meant in a second, but it just um, uh, published a new edition of Mozart Requiem for Berenreiter 2022 and uh, uh, we want to know, we want to go behind the scenes of what happened there. We want to ask what, uh, what happened, what he did, how he did it, why. And my colleague Timothy Schanz here is uh, someone who is going to conduct Mozart Requiems. Oh, uh, I am, yes. Yes, <laughs> he is. But we try to do this with questions about music, this series that we try to align to big performance project in the department. And um, soon the Madrigal Singers, the Concert Choirs, and the University Symphony Orchestra are all going to collaborate in a performance of the Mozart Requiem. Conducted by Petar Donjerski. Thank you. Uh, and uh, I'm conducting another performance in Calgary just a, a week and a half, two weeks before. So yeah. <laughs> but even just choosing which edition to use for this performance has made us uh, think about, well, that's a perfect question to ask <laughs> about wha what Mozart's score are we using for these performances. And so we invited an expert and we have a conversation about that. So maybe perhaps I could sketch very briefly what's the issue here, why Mozart's Requiem is a fragment before asking my guests to, to pitch in on what they did about that. But uh, for those that are unfamiliar with it, um, Mozart's Requiem remained a fragment in the sense that there is literally one movement of the Requiem where Mozart wrote just the first eight bars and that's it. <laughs> didn't finish the movement and didn't finish the mass. So someone had to complete the mass so that Constance Mozart, the widow, could actually get the money of the contract that Mozart has signed. So very simply, there, was, there needed to be um, two, three movements more <laughs> for the mass to, 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 to be done. But, and so, um, first of all, if very, very soon after Mozart that Constance is looking for people to do this job. But there is more, even the movements that Mozart had written had not been written completely. There was only some parts written in the score. So the full orchestral version was not there. Let me give you an example. Maybe you know the movement Confutatis. 
Confutatis, confutatis, maledictis, maledictis, flammis, maledictis, flammis, adenentadum, tum. So basically, Mozart wrote just this, the vocal parts. Aside from the very, um, the very uh, characteristic part in the bass, so you may have heard this before, but if you look at Mozart's autograph today, that's what he wrote in the autograph. That's, uh, then someone else wrote the other parts that are still today in the same score um, that Mozart started. In this case, this was Joseph Eibler, a composer that started doing this work of completing the, the Mozart Requiem, but he didn't finish. At some point, <laughs> Constanze had to find someone else, in this case, Sussmeyer, to write, to complete, to uh, actually redo the orchestration. Sussmeyer, um, instead of working directly in Mozart's scores, started from scratch, so there is another manuscript. Uh, and then Sussmeyer wrote the missing movements as well. So there are these two kind of interventions that were required, the fuller orchestration and composing some movements from scratch. It's a big group project. It's yeah. a big project. Um, so uh, recently someone uh, directed me to a Wikipedia page that lists the modern completions of Mozart Requiems and there are more than 25 of them listed. So I want to ask our expert in the room, who is the author of one of these completions, why are there 25 modern completion of Mozart Requiem? <laughs> That is the big question. Um, since we have a historical completion, that's the major difference from, for example, um, the C minor mass, where there isn't an historical completion. Um, you know, Süßmeier's um, work has been criticized from early on and has been doubted from early on. Actually, even Mozart's original parts has, have been doubted from very early on, um, and um, in the 20th century there was, uh, no, I have to start before that, uh, when the Requiem was published, there was a tradition already to craft arrangements of, of pieces, like, like for the Requiem there was a version for string quartet, or there was a version for uh, two pianos and harmonium, and these, and, and when the Paris uh, premiere happened in uh, 19, 19, 1804, um, they made an entirely new arrangement, uh, putting in different movements from other composers, uh, taking out some movements, and also rewriting some instrumentations. So, in the evolution of the piece, to recreate portions of it for special occasions is already there. And in the 20th century, there was the endeavor to, um, to correct Süßmeier. So in a way to stay as historical as possible, but still uh, craft a new version based on Süßmeier's um, completion, which is more close, that is basically the effort, I think, the goal, uh, which is more close to Mozart's writing and you know this is a holy cow of course and <laughs> first of all and secondly there is not one version which everybody would agree upon this is impossible I guarantee you if you can bring back Mozart from his grave and get him to complete it there won't be a consensus about it being the completion by Mozart, <laughs> even in his, from his, uh, based on his version. It's not possible, yeah. because the human experience is so music to 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 uh, listen to music is so personal. Yeah, and um, and that's the reason why there are so many versions because um, people try to to analyze what Mozart did. I think basically and then try to offer their own solutions. Yeah. And since nobody can agree upon one of these solutions, there are still more versions 
presented, including my own. <laughs> Which makes a lot of sense. No, thank you for this. Like, in a way, this, this aspect that there is not one single version, and you put it so well in your introduction, there is not one single version by one person of this piece, which I think is very illuminating. In a way, one could say almost the same about every piece of music, because if you think about how many hands, how many people collaborate, whether the author is aware of that or not, um, in every performance that we make of music. Mm -hmm. But this is particularly the case, and probably uh, one of the reasons why Mozart Requiem is the, probably the most discussed unfinished piece in the choral repertoire, it's because People started debating this very early on. Susmaya died in 1803, so there was almost no one to go back to and say, like, what did you actually do? <laughs> <laughs> like, people tried, and there, were, there are some letters. He wrote a famous letter to Breitko von Hertel in 1800. But um, later on, as the Mozart myth exploded, and Constance Mo Mozart kept wanting to sell this score <laughs> to various people, uh, Michael very uh, brilliantly um, put his slide like this in his text, you say that uh, she sold it four times all over. Um, because she had some debts and also she wanted to make the most of the score. But um, people immediately already in the 1820s were starting doubting the authenticity of the piece, precisely because Constance Mozart kept repeating that the piece was entirely <laughs> authentic. So there was this um, these confusion since the beginning, hence a lot of talk about it, hence one of, one of the reasons why this piece is probably so talked about. And mysterious, there is an aura, almost a romantic aura about what we don't know, and so people's imagination can fly around what it might have been. Did Constance Marta say the truth or not at all? Um, who, who is right and who is wrong? And this is um, perfectly enc uh, encapsulated by a lot of people wanting to have uh, a say about it and precisely and perhaps even wanted to say like oh maybe I want to play the music in this way or in this mm -hmm. other way. Mm -hmm. So I wanted to ask um, Tim as a performer that faces this um, enormous amount of choice what do you do or what has been your experience so far like do we have mostly in our ears Suss Meyer's version or that's not true or you go to different, what are different concepts you find different v versions? What are the normal expectations of the audience and of performers in dealing with Mozart's Requiem? I think the normal expectation is um, that there is this Mozart Suss Meyer version and that um, it could be interesting to interact with a different version, but that's not to say that an audience who's attending knows either of them. I think <coughs> there's some movements that are in the popular ear, whether they've you know, been heard through film, um, but it's not a work that people know from beginning to end, but they actually do know the beginning and the end since they <laughs> repeat. So there's, there's this, uh, I think, the, the, you know, there's a fascination through some of the, the movements that have been used in popular media and I think there's a fascination but a lot of wonderful wonderful music that people are drawn to. So then in terms of choosing uh, an edition it goes back to maybe what, sh what you as a director might be familiar with or what you'd prefer to stick with but then there's also practicalities of oh well we'd have to pay a lot of money to get a new edition. Yeah. <laughs> uh, you know, for a lot of chorus societies, oh well, we own the the old Kalmus edition. That's what we're using. Yeah. Oh, <laughs> well, you know, obviously you have to invest in a new edition. You have yeah. to invest in the parts. So there's the practicalities of just deciding to take on another edition because you cannot you cannot do two of these together. These, uh, unlike some works where you could work with a couple different editions you really have to be marrying these two together. Yeah. Between uh, the orchestra and the, and the chorus. Of course, so. and you know, um, thank you for saying that. In a way, the pick and choose is, is less um, ideal in the sense that people have taken radically different approaches. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. some, some people have taken Sussmeyer orchestration completely out and rewrote it from scratch. 
Some other people have used some of Eibler orchestration, some of Sussmeier, really different approaches. And I'm going to ask Michael what he did because it's so fascinating to think about this. Um, but you know, what you just said also reminded me that not many people, even if they're familiar with, let's say, the movement that I badly sang at the beginning, um, but they're not necessarily familiar with the orchestration mm -hmm. of the movement. They are familiar with the vocal parts, maybe with the bass parts that I, that I mentioned as well, that is quite idiomatic, that is quite characteristic. But what the mid, you know, maybe the, uh, the, the middle part is not necessarily what an audience focuses all the time. What do you think, Michael, about this, the orchestration of the middle parts, which is quite, when we talk about the movements that uh, Mozart did write in a skeletal kind of fashion, um, do you think that the audience notices different orchestrations in your experience? I, I don't know if it would be good if they notice, because um, in a way the orchestration needs to be uh, tailored to what Mozart did, that when you don't notice a big difference, maybe you just have it right. But when you cross the line and it's too uh, much in the foreground, because you overdo stuff, um, being, uh, being very, very um, engaged to write good music, um, that could be a problem. I think, uh, I think more of the more recent completions try to just add material which probably Mozart would not have added. And there is an important aspect to this, which for my completion was, was very crucial. You know, we know how Mozart notated his music. He actually, when he crafted his music, there, was, there were two big steps. He did a few, of, um, a few things before that, but when it came to write down the real piece, the first step was to write the main substance into the score. That's what we have in the Requiem from Dia's era onward. And the second step would then be to write all the rest. And so we, have, we can compare in Mozart's um, creative process to what extent he added uh, music from step one to step two. And so that was for me was a guideline to not do much more than this and not do less than this. So there's sort of a narrow margin to which you, which you have to hit when you really want to come close to Mozart, when that is the point. Yeah. I, I think it's not, that's not the point for all of the new completions which are presented today. But um, for the for the musicologists, um, uh, musicology uh, uh, ones, uh, this certainly was the the um, major uh, goal. Yeah, it's interesting uh, because what you just mentioned, it is true. Some of these um, completion come from very different contingents of people. Some are more um, people that, that consider themselves musicologists. Some other are choral conductors. Some other are composers who take the the challenge of. Uh, seeing what, 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 what could have Mozart done here. And sometimes, you know, they fall exactly in, 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 in this, that it comes a little bit, a bit of a more of a denser thing, as if, as if they were being composedly challenged. It's like, I see Mozart did a lot of orchestration, and I think they are, um, they are all different. He doesn't repeat, so let me not repeat, or not, let me not double parts mm -hmm. and mm -hmm. add much more, and it becomes, as you were saying, an orchestration that is much... Um, more evident. What do you think about orchestration, well, Tim? It, no, I, I think it's fascinating. And so uh, in Calgary, as I said, we're doing, I think I said, we're doing the Levin edition. Uh, so Robert Levin being also a performer. It's a, so it's a, this edition, I'd say, would take a looser uh, uh, approach to uh, the fragments in a way. and and uh, open up other possibilities. Uh, Michael's uh, book, uh, Fact and Fiction, uh, really addresses some interesting things, and I found this fascinating, of how Mozart would have really kept with proper tessitura through an entire work, and stuck with um, the, a right range that maybe you exceeded the range once in a while with the voice, but it was for dramatic purpose. And uh, there's this Amen fugue, which is a subject that gets into a bit more detail than some want to know, perhaps. But it's a, it's a fragment that we can uh, c 
connect with. Uh, there's disputing fragments of what could be used. But Levin's Amen Fugue, I, it, I find it actually f almost funny. It's, uh, it's, it doesn't sound like Mozart to me. Uh, and it doesn't, it, 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 as Michael said, it uses uh, you know, older style in the way it writes out the fugue, not, not modulating at all. Uh, I'll let him talk about that. <laughs> but the point is that it goes actually to very high tessitura <coughs> for the singers. And it, it, uh, it jumps out as you as something that doesn't quite fit into the, the entire work. But uh, I also think that that's okay. It's, it's an okay place to live. But you have to realize what you're taking on in that this is something that's different. It's not, it is in a way attempting to create uh, an addition in the style. Yeah. But that is... I think the version of that compared to a musicological perspective uh, is really broadening much further than, yeah. than some are comfortable with. Yeah. Well, maybe we maybe I can. Yeah, I please. I, please. This is um, what, what Timothy just um, talked about. It brings up an important question. What are the criteria for us to evaluate a completion? And, you know, if people feel or a lot of people feel this is Mozart and a lot of people feel that about Levin's version. So is this alone a criterion, criter criterion to, to say yes, he succeeded? And I think the um, fascinating thing about Levin's edition is actually that in, the, in terms of how the musical text sticks to Mozart's musical text, is it, this is quite yeah, it's quite far from what Mozart writes. Still, a lot of people think this is very close to it. <laughs> and I don't mean it in an ironic way. I really, it's, it's just really a question how we perceive music. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And maybe what, what Levin's genius is here, that he somehow captured the essence for a lot of people that this is the spirit of Mozart in, in this piece. <laughs> and that this spirit for many, many people is without a question there. But when you look at the musical texts and read them, yeah, you see a lot of things which Mozart had never done. Yeah. And that's maybe the inter interesting uh, ambiguity here, which, um, which is also a tricky thing in discussing these questions. Of course. And I, I want to kind of like uh, sort of like continue this this train of thought in a second because I want to ask you how you went about doing this. But yes. I, I I'm so glad that you are mentioning that people feel so differently about this. It becomes about feeling about what do you think Mozart is and whether Mozart has one identity or as or a more processual identity that changes, which is something that, for example, Michael. Michael Tex uh, take care of quite, mm -hmm. quite, quite a bit. But I wanted, since you mentioned the sketches, I wanted to, to tell a little bit of uh, romantic gossip oh, great. Um, yeah. about them. So because, <laughs> of course, there was a moment in which uh, Constance Mozart was uh, cornered and said, like, but actually, Susmaya has mentioned that these movements are not by Mozart. But she, of course, was trying to keep this together. So it's like, what if, say, I gave to Susmaya some sketches that were on the desk when Mozart died. And then wouldn't ma that make the Requiem all authentic? And uh, we, of course, don't know. We cannot verify. M Michael, correct me at any point. You are the expert. Um, we cannot verify if this really happened or not. But there is this sketch, the, this Amen fragment, which is um, in some sketches near the magic flute. Am I, am I right? And um, which was around the time that he was thinking about um, the Requiem as well, of course. But uh, there is also the fact that we don't know, the fact that there is, exists a sketch. You know, sometimes people do sketch something and they then do absolutely nothing with it. <laughs> and they change entirely. They make another sketch, which it might not be there for us to see. So, you know, we, we, it's interesting to see what Constance and Mozart uh, said and, you know, how we think about authenticity. But also we should think about very practically about people changing their mind all the time. And um, I'm sure that Michael would tell you as well that sometimes Mozart changed his mind between the first phase of writing the score and the second. So there is a lot there that can change. Of course, it can also stay exactly the same <laughs> and it can be just completed. And so you can have some 
uh, a lot of insight, in fact, by comparing the two phases of Mozart writing the score. But Michael, I think this might be a wonderful moment for, for you to tell us a little bit more what you did. What, what is your approach different from some of these other editions that are out there? Yeah, I'll do that in a second. I just want to comment on what you just said, of Fabio. Course. Um, what I said in the, about the two phases, actually there are more phases um, and, and some of them uh, happening before and the Amen sketch is from a phase before that when Mozart just made notes for himself. Yep. When he wrote the fair copy, so the Mozart fragment, there is actually not actually no changes happen from that onward, of course. From, from this step to the next one in, in, in Mozart's creative process. So we can be sure about that, about the, it's what is in the Mozart Requiem fragment, that's really written. Yeah, definitely. But the Amen view is another, another type of sketch, which could be in there, but also he could have discarded. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> so it's a different, different type of, of uh, writings um, uh, preserved. Yeah, in different moments, uh, as you said, entirely. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But tell us about right. your edition. Yes. Sure. So my my um, what I tried is to really really take into account is what Mozart did right until um, when he started to write his Requiem. So I really analyzed all of the works uh, we have by Mozart. So I tried to compose in a way forward to the point of when the Requiem has had to be written. And then I took also the completions we have. We have the completion by Süßmeier and we have an um, incomplete completion, if that makes sense, by, uh, by Eibler. And I took also these two pieces and then I wrote, composed these completions backwards and trying then to reach the middle, if you could say this. Hmm. Um, um, and in doing so, I most importantly, I really, really consulted Mozart's works for every question multiple times. Then I also uh, took into account the um, m music theory of Mozart's time to, to understand the music. So I, I, there are, there are um, teaching materials by Mozart. And there are also, we know which, um, which textbooks Mozart knew. And I, I, um, I, I also draw on them, drew on them. And then um, the creative process, I already mentioned that, was also important for me so that I, I can orientate, my, could orientate to how much would Mozart add in the second run when writing the fair copy. And... Um, and then maybe the last point is what you already um, um, touched upon. There are some um, statements in the letters, uh, for example, and um, and there are some we could we could um, try to figure out based on these statements. For example, if really there was instruction. Uh, to Süßmeier uh, by Mozart, because there's, for example, there is an um, there is a report by um, by um, uh, Sophie Heibel, which was um, Mozart's, uh, I think, sister-in-law is the term. Then yes, That's I it. think so. And um, and she remembers uh, that when in the night Mozart died. That she came into the house and there was Süßmeier at the at the bed, and that uh, Mozart did give instruction and even dictated timpani timpani uh, rhythms. And on all of these statements, I also try to to evaluate them and at least see to that they don't contradict um, what I was coming up with. Yeah. So that it's at least this and and what you said about all these reports, that's true. We have to keep in mind that all these statements about the Requiem were written down um, at the least 
32 years after the fact. And if you remember, try to remember what you did 32 years ago, <laughs> even if it was important, if, even if it was an important um, event. So, um, um, speaking of the, um, of the um, sketches, you know, um, so Constanze is speculating herself yeah. 30 years plus later, yeah. if there could have been some. So <laughs> you can decide by yourself how true that might be. <laughs> yeah. This was also a time, you know, we were talking about the early 19th century where Constance and, and these people were talking about the authenticity of the requiem in the first place. This was a time that there wasn't yet so much concern for authenticity or for uh, authorship in the same way we think about it today. Maybe you know, the debates around the Mozart Requiem might be, I don't want to say the first uh, historically, because I don't believe in, in historical first, but certainly the, the debate around the Requiem did consolidate um, some of the concern uh, around, you know, towards a culture that we, that is more familiar uh, to us about um, aspects of authenticity. But, you know, just to go back to what you said about um, your edition, Michael, so basically, you looked a lot at other music by Mozart. So this is my idea. But whereas other people have looked more at, um, you know, maybe their own completion or the, you know, specifically Susmeyer or Eibler or making a, a bit between the two. You have, you have done work that it's outside the Requiem, look, looking, at, looking at outside the Requiem for models. Is that, is that? Uh, That's correct. And I might want to add, I forgot, um, I also looked at models Mozart used, mm -hmm. in particular by Bach and Handel. We know from the letters that here a lot of, of, a lot of the things I explained come together. We know from the letters that Mozart um, admired music by Bach, especially fugues. We know from the letters that he wanted to use Bach's music as model for his church music. We know from um, Stadler's report of Mozart's workshop after Mozart died that there were studies Mozart did of Handel's music. So he wrote, he, he made copies of Handel's music and crafted them into a, his own music. And from this we all know for sure um, that Bach and Handel were important um, models, firstly, and secondly, we know which pieces Mozart knew by Bach and Handel. Yeah. So that was me a guideline to also use this, to also look in these pieces, in this particular pieces Mozart knew, and then to, to look if I can find similarities already in what Mozart had written, and then to, to somehow have sort of the same background, yeah. and then also and then also seek out particular moment, moments in, in special fugues, with, which I think would have been a very good fit in the Requiem for the Ayman fugue, for example. Yeah. What, what and I, maybe the last, oh, uh, maybe if I just want to add one yeah. thing, what I also did, of course, is to, to look in all the efforts my dear um, fellows and colleagues have presented, because um, I mean, um, all these early attempts at, compl at completion, I admire them very, very much. And of course, that was also important for me to, um, to appreciate them, to study them, analyze them and, and learn from them. Yeah. So we are on the shoulders, of course, of, of all these important um, predecessors. May I ask though, Michael, I, for me, I've, that feels like a minefield. I mean, what, with, with, with all of you know, these additions, what, what, you know, how did you decide you wanted to take this on? It kept egging at you, I, I assume. You know, my, my, um, my, the argument for myself was there is room um, which so far in my mind is untouched to get closer to Mozart's style, to Mozart's um, composition technique. And uh, by that I mean that you can derive from his compos compositions certain criteria for different things, like the tessituras. Mm -hmm. uh, you yeah. know, I checked all the tessituras and the tessituras, of course, are connected to the counterpoint. Mm -hmm. Because how you layer the counterpoint is dependent on uh, how the tessituras are in the parts. Mm 
Yeah. And that's the problem, for example, with Levin's version. He layers them in a way that he goes on top of the tessitura all the time, which is more like late Beethoven. Yeah. And, um, and that is just an example. I, I, I analyzed all the um, compositions by Mozart free from music theoretical um, dogmatism. You know, like there is a dominant, there is a tonic, there is there's a, a false relation. The false relation is a very good term to demonstrate uh, music theoretical dogmatism because <laughs> it is, of course, it's a special relation, but it's not false. It's yeah. everywhere in the yeah. writing of Mozart. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> no, I like this very much. Yeah. And um, I want to, to go back to a couple of things that Michael said, because I, yes. I want to make sure that we don't let those pass. First, thank you for saying that you are celebrating this tradition of other people completing the, the work of Mozart because not many people would say the same. So this needs to be appreciated and we need more of that in terms of musicologists being acknowledging the work um, in a positive and inclusive and constructive way. So thank you for that attitude, it's very much appreciated. I'm sure the performers and people in the room appreciate that too. But one thing that you said um, that I finally, I, I like your approach in, for two other reasons. One is that it feels like you wanted to have in the ears what Mozart might have had, which I find fascinating. It's a, it's a more kind of like almost phenomenological uh, way of completing Mozart's score uh, through kind of like the experience mm -hmm. of what might have been in their ears in the workshop, what kind of fugues by, by J.S. Bach he was working on. So I like that a lot. But also, I think something that we haven't stressed enough is that you also wrote uh, your completion of the Requiem in a way mm -hmm. that is not just one version. There are some movements in which you say like you could go with this movement or with this other version of the same movement. It's like a, a choose your own adventure uh, Mozart Requiem. Mm -hmm. And uh, so first of all I wanted to ask you a little bit more uh, you know about this, about this choose your own adventures and you know was this difficult to convince Berenreiter <laughs> to, <laughs> to do it? Uh, or were they very eager? Like because sometimes what you say, what you say in the introduction that this is no piece by one person and there is not one piece. There is Mozart Requiem. I think it's very convincing to me. But I, I'm curious to see how much you have to fight to do something in print that is different. And then I'm going to ask Tim the choice your own adventure in Requiem mm -hmm. for a performer. Go ahead, Michael. Yeah, great question. Really great. You know, for me. This is a very long evolution, I think, for everyone. You, you try to come up with first answers to, to small little questions, and this happens a million of time until you have some first draft of a movement like an Amen Fugue, which was not there before, and then you still refine, refine, go back to what you had, discard something you had, and, and so forth. And um, very Early on, I knew that for some decisions, there is you couldn't really decide if it if it would be version A or B, which uh, neither of them would be impossible, but both of them would be possible in, in the, to the same degree. And this sometimes had to do with like the um, key disposition, because when there are repeating parts. They need to be sometimes in the same key, and this is not the case in Süßmeier. So that when you stick to Süßmeier, you have sometimes to change one of the segments uh, because it's in the wrong key. But you could go the other way around and change the other section and keep the key from this one you discarded in the first version. That's basically what I did in the Sanctus Benedictus area, uh, because uh, for me there were very, very strong arguments for both solutions, right. including arguments that are not based on composition technique, but, but based on uh, listening experience, yes. which, is, which is very strong. You know, the tradition of performing the piece is very strong. And mm -hmm. I think when you are familiar with the piece, Timothy in the beginning uh, talked about uh, what is in the, in the ear from the piece. Many people who know the music have the music very um, present. Mm -hmm. And for them, I think, for me as well, it's even harder to decide, is that really uh, in Mozart's style or is it not? Because you are just so used to it. Yeah. And um, that's really hard, hard things. And then you ask me uh, what Baron writer, um, or if it was hard to convince Baron. No, at not, not at all. I have to say Baron writer was so 
supportive and so um, constructive. I could do so many changes Amazing. during the process and um, I never the best publishing out in the world. Sorry, everybody else. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not I'm not doing a, a, a commercial a commercial for Baron Matter here, but <laughs> not the yet. way how, how they really you know, they wanted the create, creative, the, the, the content was the basic thing they wanted to have right, uh, correct and yeah. wanted in a way that I am happy. Yeah, uh, excellent. No matter how expensive, no matter how much time it costs. And, um, I, you know, I even had long in the process, I had even an alternative version for the Lacrimosa. And um, as, you, as you can imagine, in, in the process, I also have multiple versions for the arm and, and um, <laughs> I shortened then a, a lot of a lot of um, stages. Yeah. What just happened was that I shortened a segment here and here. And I and and um, for Baron Writer, there was actually a, in the very first corrections we we made, there was still um, an alternate for the Lacrimosa. Right. I mean, for the Zeusmeyer Lacrimosa, not the Amen. Yeah, yeah. And then I decided at some point to discard it because then happened something um, that the arguments for the Süßmeier version for me became much more stronger and I thought okay what I did is not better than what Süßmeier did. Oh, I love this and kind of like this, this show in the process <laughs> like even in what you uh, um, in what you ended up printing. How about a performer dealing with a choose your own adventure requiem? Well, I love it. I mean, I, we, we seriously considered this uh, Baron Ryder edition for the university performance here, uh, but chose to uh, go with the, you know, the, the war horse, you could call it. Uh, but I, I mean, I, I love this idea. And I think also um, it can create dialogue with the performers so that you, we all get a better understanding of how we make choices or what choices we may make and then how that's uh, influenced through, through what we're given. So I mean, even just in talking about this Amen Fugue, uh, for those that don't know, the Lacrimosa uh, is familiar to your ears, you know it. Uh, and then it ends in the Zeusmeyer with this plagal cadence, Amen, and it's over. and and. There's, you know, it definitely was um, history at the time to have a fugato or a f full fugue uh, on those words. So extending that portion. So it's not just, doesn't just finish with long notes done. And so that, uh, this has been, you know, quite, uh, there's been a lot written in a lot of different versions of this. And that's what we're, you know, that's just one little tiny portion here. But uh, so to choose how one might finish uh, that movement. And I, I love how you talk about how uh, the Zeusmeyer was very compelling to you in the end. Yeah, this is really fascinating to me. And I, I you know, the, the 11 different sighing motives are, are you know, they, that creates in a way a conflict in my ear, but I also enjoy it. Mm -hmm. I enjoy it because it, um, it's sort of going against something else that you already know. Um, and I don't think an audience always picks that up because they hear this consistency in that edition, but, uh, but going back to those original sighing motives in the violins of the Zeusmeyer, I can completely understand that. Mm. Yeah. Um, and the Choose it Your Own Adventure, I want to ask Michael a question about this because he also mentioned, you know, of course, now we're just on the cusp of AI versions of this piece. Uh, you know, so what's, 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 uh, what are the possibilities if one could actually just come to a performance and, or, and maybe the performance is in a room and you just press something and then you can hear a different version of it, right? <laughs> what are your thoughts on AI with this? <laughs> you know, um, we yeah. are on the verge of really, as, as you all know, um, on, on, on a verge here because AI will completely revo revolutionize um, uh, how we work, how we have results. Mm -hmm. uh, I, I think Fabio and, and Timothy and me, we are in a generation where we don't grow up with it. But all people growing up now can get results in dialogue with an AI. And I think it's the rule already for many, 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 many people. And it will be the rule in the next generation for sure. And um, 
I'm, I don't know. I, I don't know how to feel about it. Um, there has been this huge Beethoven uh, completion done by an AI, but it, this actually was not done by an AI. The AI crafted a lot of different uh, possibilities and some people decided this is the best. So it's not really it, the AI uh, helped and assisted in, in, uh, in presenting different uh, possibilities. Mm. You know, I'm not sure. I'm sure that the AI will be uh, very quickly be able to do a requiem completion, yeah. a very good one, maybe a, a better one than a human being could do, uh, maybe in 20 years, I'm not sure, in 30 years. Today, you know, today I'm much better than an AI is. <laughs> and a lot of people are as well, not, not me. You know, there's been this uh, Bach chorale generators, AI-based, um, um, uh, you can, you could put in a melody and they, and the generator gave you a Bach chorale harmonization. And yeah. firstly, all humans in the room, uh, my, all my colleagues were much faster, like 10 times faster in doing <laughs> a better version. Um, yeah. And secondly, maybe in, another question about this is like the you know, like that is that is the Matrix paradoxon. You know, in, in the Matrix film, there's this uh, this scene where this bad guy is eating the steak, and he says to to this agent, "I don't want to know that this is not a real steak." Uh, yeah. And this 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 question is is uh, there's some term I don't remember the term for it. Mm -hmm. There's some term for this basic question, and this maybe this. What you asked him is is um, along those lines. I think I think that the quote is, is is I think he says ignorance is bliss. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. Right, right, right. right. <laughs> Which, and so, but maybe do what, we do we want do we want to have a product crafted by a human being or yeah. not? That is maybe the question. Yeah, I, I, I would prefer it because I have grown up this way, but I don't know if it's right or wrong. Yeah. <laughs> But maybe, you know, maybe what we, are your thoughts on it? Maybe we can focus uh, as a because what you said um, that you appreciate about um, these aspects of Michael's um, approach, I think is really um, telling and evocative about the fact that everyone is a bit of a little bit of a collaborator or a co author. Mm -hmm. I like the fact that in a way this is both um, a completion of Mozart's Requiem, very much of this post structuralist time in which we live, but also maybe even closer to what um, in the late 18th century people would have um, cared about in handling a score, which in a way predated some of our concerns mm -hmm. to do with. Um, authorship, copyright, authenticity, and so on and so forth. But people, it's 2.47 and this for me is the perfect moment to open the floor for questions to the people in the audience and um, also those are joining the live stream. So uh, questions for Michael, for Tim. Mm -hmm. Yes, there is Dylan. I have a question for Michael. Michael, have you uh, received any critiques for your own completion of the work, and uh, how do you uh, respond to those? You you uh, you said critic, mm -hmm. yes. critics. Well, yeah. Okay. Good question, Dylan. You know, from the the um, the uh, process of doing my version was that I had performances very early on, and then still worked on the edition. And people came to me and said to me, oh, I like this or I like that. And uh, that gave me the opportunity to still reconsider. And that was very important to me. So the end, what, what was printed by Bärenreiter already is, uh, went through many, many runs of corrections in a way. Um, uh, where also musicians were helpful, like from the period orchestras who performed on the recording, which is out there. And um, and also after the um, after the uh, um, edition came out, there of course have been different um, reviews in in uh, magazines and uh, and so forth. And um, I am happy that most of them are very very positive. And there are some still uh, not liking this or that, which is part of the game, of course. And also there is some critique, in my opinion, not justified. That's also okay. And um, I think that's just the 
way life goes. You have to <laughs> you 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 give something to the world, and um, there are people when when it is um, when it is getting attention. Of course, that's a good thing, and that means also that it's being criticized. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So there was Caleb. Sure. Uh, yeah. So another question from Michel. Um, I'm curious to know what you found most challenging and the easiest in the orchestration specifically. So thinking about Mozart or Bach or Handel, um, I don't know, it strikes me where performer and composer sort of map on to each other. So that Mozart first and foremost was he a keyboardist or a violinist? We've maybe thrown some tomatoes at Robert Levin's edition, but Bob Levin absolutely is a keyboardist first and foremost. And I wonder how much that plays into the writing, not only historically, but now when you're making an edition. Yeah, that's very interesting. Yes, I think that, um, you know, Mozart is beyond every everyone uh, for sure. Probably yes, and very high intelligence, nobody for us has. And you can see that this in his course, and also see this from from that people testified that he could remember pieces mm -hmm. by just hearing them once. There's this anecdote that he listened to a piece in you know the Miserere and could write it down by memory. There is certainly much truth to this, and he could like um, configure in his head this Handel piece and this Bach piece and then put it into his own fugue ideas and so forth very easily. And uh, we can do it maybe also, but at, at least I, I need maybe like 10 times longer than <laughs> Mozart did and I need all the scores to have there. But you asked what was the most difficult thing and what about the instrumentation. I think the practical aspect is very, very important. Um, I think um, not only the practical aspect to play music, but to have experience in writing music, which is performed. I think that's, uh, with all due respect to my um, colleagues, that a lot of people starting out doing these first editions didn't have experience in writing music, which was performed, mm -hmm. like Richard Maunder, also Levin. They never composed a piece, actually, or did a professional orchestration for an orchestra to perform on a on a on a day-to-day um, -day level. You know what I mean? And that is a different experience. Like Mozart did this all of his life, all of his in every week there was one learning uh, effect he he gained from having something written and have having uh, and being able to listen to it and then to process it and then do it in, in, it again. And all this experience in writing music, I think that is very, very important. And mm -hmm. for the instrumentation, um, that was for me, I think, the rather easy part because there's so much of substance by Mozart himself. So in the score, there's already all the voices and, and the bass line, and there's so many scores you can would refer to. The most difficult thing for me was to craft the new movements, mm. especially, and especially the new movements where um, Süßmeier did also write something. Mm -hmm. mm. <laughs> like the Bene you know, the Amen in a way, you didn't have to evaluate yep. the Süßmeier material. Because right? there wasn't one. Yeah. Yeah. That's right. Right. And for the, the Benedictus was for me maybe one of the hardest things because everybody knows it and it's a beautiful piece but the structure of it is completely un -Mozartian. and to um, to mess with this is really 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 uh, dangerous because everybody will say no this is not right <laughs> <laughs> even if you are right but yeah maybe that's yeah does it this answer the question a bit yeah, mm -hmm. for sure. Other questions? You, uh, we can still take it, but I, I, this just goes ag again to that Benedictus movement, uh, Michael. I'd love to hear um, your thoughts on the, how, you know, how transparent you made the orchestration in that movement. Uh, how did you work with instruments in that movement, with solo voices? You know, there's a certain tradition in the church music in particular, uh, but in uh, vocal in vocal ensemble music 
also. You know, this is a certain type of music. It's not choral. It's it's um, soloistic ensemble. And um, there are many, many, many um, sections or movements for this in the operas and also in the church music. And there's sort of a basic pattern and there are certain basic models how Mozart uses the strings, for example, in these movements. Mm -hmm. And um, there is actually hardly any collaborator, real strict collaborator writing uh, in Mozart. But then there's also not uh, the difference of it. <laughs> like there's every time a lot of stuff going on in some instrumentation. So this is again the ideal line you have to find. And basically the, the um, the woodwind parts here, um, there are a lot of models in Mozart's handle arrangements. Mozart did these handle orchestrations. Mm -hmm. And there are some of the movements which have a very similar instrumentation than a Benedictus. And then there's, then there's this concert aria, which, um, what is the, I don't remember the title. There's a concert aria for two clarinets, two bassoons and strings and sopran solo. Mm. So basically the same set setting than the uh, Benedictus. The Requiem, uh. yeah. we, know, we know for sure that the trombones wouldn't have played. They never did in a soloistic ensemble music. At least not um, doubling the solos. And also uh, the trumpets and timpani very, very likely wouldn't have played. So that is what Süßmeier very likely did not in the way Mozart would have done, the, the because he brought all this in. The trombone students here just were upset about that, but <laughs> they, they need to know it's only for I'm that, sorry, I'm it's sorry. only that solo movement we're talking about. Because of the wise, incredible yeah, part, trombone part. It is. There's a lot for the trombones in this piece. And the trombones it, are great, and yeah. from the very beginning they are fantastic. The very first four notes, great, brilliant, brilliant. Yeah, yeah. But not the Benedictus. <laughs> <laughs> Any other question for Michael before we, we thank him and we uh, invite everyone to join us for a glass of wine? Yes, please. Like, we certainly thought about what would Mozart have done, but first, like, what would Mozart have done when? Like, he'd come back and finished it when he was 45 or 55. Mm. What if, you know, if we, before or after that really annoying summer where Ludwig van Beethoven insisted on them spending all that time together and just wouldn't go away, you know, like, we, like, oh, I'm, I'm sorry, sorry. I did not really get this. You think of it as sort of crystallized. Yeah, uh, well, the, the question Naomi is asking is, you know, it, of course, it's Mozart as we know, but if, if he would have lived another 10 years, it would have been a different Mozart or another 10, or the life experiences and, that he had. So, you know, which Mozart are we using, you know? That's a very, very good question. And that's also something I address in my book. In my opinion, the Mozart Requiem could have only be completed by Mozart in that time. And that is like uh, the end of um, 1971. And you are absolutely right. I think uh, 10 years later, if you would present him the fragment 10 years later, he would have written a different Mozart Requiem. Sure. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And I, I tried to, um, to hit this uh, time window, you know, my, my purpose was, I know it's impossible, it's impossible, completely impossible, it's an air castle, really, <laughs> but still, my purpose was to nail the style of Mozart in October, November, 1971. Yeah. Uh, 18, uh, 1791. Yeah, that's it. Yeah. <laughs> right. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> right. I know it's so impossible, but still, that was my... Yeah. Yeah. How romantic that it's impossible. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, any final question for Michael? Feel no pressure to be in the, the last <laughs> one, but uh, otherwise I think we should thank him for Absolutely. having joined us. By now it's probably 10 p.m. You're ready for bed. But thank you so much for such an engaging uh, conversation and mm. for joining us. Uh, from the other side of the world. Can we, can we give an applause to Michael? Yeah. And thank you, of course, to Tim and, uh, and for all of you joining and asking questions. And please be uh, our guest for uh, the wine reception. Thank you again. I just want to say thank you from here. Thank you for having me. It was such a pleasure. 
Thanks for your for your very very smart questions also, and I'm really really sorry and feel very bad that I can't be there for the wine. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. Well, we can uh, you know put the video camera close to the wine for you. Yeah. <laughs> we make a prost on uh, you know for you. We make a we make a cheers yeah. on you. We'll your have wine. to have you here sometime. Exactly. Absolutely. Yeah. Thank you so much. Thank you, Michael. Great. Thank you. <laughs> Be good. <laughs> okay, then I say goodbye. Okay, ja. yeah. Yeah, wiedersehen. Auf wiedersehen. Schlaf gut. Ja.